It's such a delight to be here with all of you. Um, I feel very humbled by all of the stories that have come before me. Um, and actually, you know, for, for a few moments, just as I was coming up on stage, I was just at a loss for words because there's just so much to celebrate. There's so many Kiwis to celebrate, the ones who are on here on stage and the ones who are not on here on stage. So just a big applause for everybody. So I moved to New Zealand about 20 years ago. Uh, my parents are both Indian, um, and I grew up in the Middle East, in Oman. Um, and when I was coming to New Zealand, um, you know, there wasn't much I was expecting other than, wow, this is a really beautiful place, really nice people. Uh, I moved here, I started doing um, my undergrad, I did my BTEC in biomedical sciences. I had my entire life planned ahead of me. I knew I was going to be a scientist. I wanted to, uh, to work on virology or neuroscience. There were sort of a bunch of goals that I'd set for myself, and I was like, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, and then life happened, which uh, to me basically taught me that there's something really beautiful in this world called serendipity. So after my undergrad, when I signed up to do um, a PhD in neurogenetics in the Liggins Institute. Um, this was at the University of Auckland. Um, I was sort of doing this really exciting project, working with a great team of people focused on identifying and characterizing a gene um, in mice for brain repair. Um, completely out of the blue, um, with the lure of free pizza, which is always a huge lure, um, I went to this uh, event, which was focused on talking about how New Zealand really needed to create a knowledge economy. This was back in 2003. I didn't really even know what knowledge economy meant. Cheese pizza sounded good. Um, and so there were just some, you know, there's a, there a few people talking. There was uh, John Hood, who at the time was the vice chancellor of Auckland University, Jeff Witcher, uh, who's been recognized recently as, uh, in the Queen's Honor Awards. Uh, but at the time, you know, there was just this story that I heard, which was about the fact that New Zealand, over the last 30 years, had slipped from 3 to 30 in the OECD indices. Again, I didn't know what OECD indices meant, but just sort of listening to those people speak at the time, I remember thinking to myself that what we here in New Zealand at the time were talking about and trying to create was an ecosystem focused on harnessing an entrepreneurial spirit that is embedded within Kiwis. We went on from there to start a program called Spark, now called Velocity, which is really about tapping into first class ideas that Kiwis had and converting them into world-class businesses. It was about breaking down academic ivory towers and turning them into revving engines of economic growth. And these were all really fancy taglines, but really what that meant was that each of us as Kiwis were no longer, the, the goal was that we were no longer thinking of ourselves as artists or mathematicians or scientists or business people. We were all a part of making New Zealand great and stand out on the world stage. In that process, what I realized was, on one hand here I was doing this PhD, which was really exciting, and on the other hand I was part of this incredible opportunity where we were helping channel this entrepreneurial transformative spirit within our fellow Kiwis, and what I realized was I loved science and technology, but what I loved even more was the ability to take exciting and innovative technology and build products, solutions, services that actually helped people, that helped society. So I went on to do my MBA in the US um, and this was around 2006 and this was really when the clean tech uh, movement sort of got a resurgence because oil prices were really high at the moment, at that time and so everyone was paying attention um, and actually, thanks to the Kiwi Network, 
I was able to get these really exciting opportunities to work in that clean tech realm, one of whom was Dr. Colin South. Uh, he was previously at Fonterra and had started a really exciting company uh, focused on renewable fuels in Boston. Um, so did my first internship there, got a flavor of what, uh, what, the, what the renewable fuel world looked like, and then went on to join uh, Lanza Tech, also started by a Kiwi, Dr. Sean Simpson, um, and had this tremendous launch pad and learning experience over two years after business school, and then realized through that and at the end of that experience that it was time for me to actually create something that I was deeply passionate about um, and also tap into my own entrepreneurial spirit. So in about 2011, as I stepped back and uh, looked at you know, where we were at in the world, this was in Silicon Valley, everyone was celebrating technology. That's what we do, we celebrate technology growth. We celebrate advancement in technology. As the World Economic Forum says, today we're at the fourth industrial revolution which harnesses all these exciting new technologies. But what happens at the end of life of technology? What is the dark side of Moore's law? And that was when, if you looked at the exponential rate at which technology was growing, at which devices were proliferating, there was a parallel in the rate of obsolescence. So if you look at the average lifespan of devices, it has gone down from five to eight years to now about 18 months. Think of every time there's a new iPhone or an iPad or an iWatch or a Nexus or this or that, we're all really excited to get it and now you have another phone, another device that's shoved into your drawer or somewhere in your garage. In 2011, the United Nations estimated that there were about 40 million tons of electronic waste generated globally. 40 million tons. As just as a visualization, in the US alone, we generate enough cell phones, we dispose enough cell phones to cover 50 football fields every day. There's a lot of e-waste out there. And what's tragic today is that a majority of consumer e-waste is landfilled. About 80% of e-waste goes into the ground, and of the stuff that is not dumped into the ground, it goes to places like India, China, Africa, where it is treated in very hazardous ways to recover value from those devices. So Guiyu, which is the e-waste capital of the world, um, it receives about one million tons of e-waste every year. The people in that town have about 300 times the level of lead in their blood compared to neighboring towns. 300 times the level of lead. They suffer from, 90% of the people there suffer from neurological damage. And the reason for that is when you try to recover value, if you actually take a circuit board in your computer, you heat it, it releases these toxic elements called dioxins and furans. Why does it do that? Our electronics have flame retardants in them. And you have flame retardants so that they don't catch fire. It's not to say that all devices don't catch fire. We know of some that do. But they're not intended to catch fire. And when, they, when you try to heat them in ways that are non, uh, or that are not uh, managed appropriately, you're releasing these toxic materials into the environment and that they're essentially damaging to the neural system. So anyway, we looked at this problem, my co-founder at the time and I, and what we realized was on one hand, we have this major human catastrophe, human generated catastrophe, and a catastrophe for people. And then on the other hand, what we realized was if you look at recovering 10 ounces of gold, which again, just to give you context, would be the same amount of gold that would go into 30 wedding bands. You could either mine 100 tons of gold ore or one ton of cell phones. So you actually have this really concentrated pool of resources in electronic waste. 
And actually, as it turned out, there is a precedent for a company about 50 years, 60 years prior that had seen a similar opportunity. This was in the steel industry. For those of you who may be familiar, a company called Nucor saw that there was an automotive revolution around the 50s where people were driving more cars. And the more cars that were driven, the more cars reached end of life, and now you had all of the scrap steel. And they basically pioneered this quintessential disruption case study where they made steel using scrap steel. Prior to that, steel was made by digging iron ore out of the ground. So you had these massive integrated steel mills. Nucor basically came in and said, well, actually, it's cheaper and more efficient to take the scrap and just recycle it. And they went on to become a Fortune 200 company. So our business model was actually developing these mini mills for e-waste. In the process, one of the, the best pieces of advice that I got was stand on the shoulders of giants. <coughs> what I also realized along the way is that I know very little about most things. And so the best thing that I can do is get the smartest people about the things that I need to help me achieve the vision that I want. And in that process, I was fortunate to meet the former CEO of this company, Nuco, the guy who built the Fortune $200 company. And he was really excited about the idea that we were working on, and he came on as our executive chairman to build our first facility in the US. Over the last six years, we've been working on developing the proof of concept and demonstrating the technology. We've raised about $50 million, and we're in the process of commissioning our first facility in Arkansas which is really exciting. This facility would be able to take 10 million kgs of electronic scrap, and we would roughly generate about one ton of gold every year, about 10 tons of silver, and about 3,000 tons of copper. We're really, really excited about where we are. And in particular, what's, what, what's really um, something that we had not predicted at the time was that this wasn't just a play in the e-waste recycling world. It was also a play in the luxury goods industry sector. So one of the things that we've been really excited to see is the interest in that sector to move towards greening, their, greening up their supply chain and move towards recycled precious metals. So think of blood diamonds and what happened in the diamond industry. It's very similar with dirty gold. And just, just this awareness that if you're gonna be wearing a gold wedding band, you don't wanna have the conscience that five people died while making it, which is actually what happens. The mining industry in the gold sector, in a lot of places, is actually really, really nefarious for the types of practices that get used, particularly in conflict areas in, in Africa. So here we are today, very excited about the progress that we're making in e-waste recycling, in mining for gold from urban materials. I think as we move forward, what's really exciting to us is that urban materials isn't just e-waste. If we think about solar panels, electric vehicles, Smart lighting. Think of everything that we today recognize are important innovations in the universe of clean technologies. All of those have to have an end of life process. And so the universe of urban mining opportunities is actually really large, particularly because we could either keep digging holes in the ground or we could create these circular processes where we're recovering the value from the materials that we're using in the environment. And I think that's a philosophical choice. We can always try to get more from 
the ground. There are people who are trying to mine the moon or asteroids. All of that's great, but philosophically, there is a choice as to what kind of world do we want to live in? Is it one that resembles Wally? Or is it one that we're proud to have this circular economy in? Just as a couple of parting thoughts, one of the things that I love about New Zealand, I've, I'm actually back after five years and sort of been, just even in the one morning I've been, been here, it's been really overwhelming in, in the best possible way. And the reason for that is, I don't think that I've ever been in a place like here where diversity is so strongly embraced. In New Zealand, I was never an Omani Kiwi or an Indian Kiwi. I was and I'm just a Kiwi. And for that, I'm really grateful because it is with that spirit of embracing diversity of thought, of color, of opinions, of gender, that we really have the opportunity to stand out, particularly given the political chaos that the rest of the world is seeing. And finally, just one of my um, go-to philosophies, as I sort of get through every day, it actually builds a little bit on what Briley said. When I was at business school, one of the most profound and powerful mottos that I took away from one of my professors there was that to be a leader, to be an entrepreneur, you always need to have a completely rational view of all of the obstacles that lie ahead of you, a completely rational view of all of the obstacles that lie ahead of you, and a completely irrational belief in your ability to overcome them. Thank you.